Keep your Bibles open, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The title this morning is The Holy Spirit and Unity in the Local Church. We're going to be referring to the material we're passing out to you as we go along, but not immediately, so just keep it handy. Um, I have a question for you. I notice that, as far as I can tell, most of you, or maybe all of you, came with your entire body this morning. Did any of you leave any of your body parts at home? Did, um, did any of you have a big discussion about whether or not you would all go to the same place and do the same thing and eat breakfast and brush your teeth and or your dentures or whatever? We're at different points in life and there are different situations that some of us have to deal with. But there are things about the body, the natural body, we, we don't question it. It's a wonderful picture, and we'll see this again as we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 in trying to understand a local assembly, a local body of believers and that we could function as a local body of believers and that we will function in line with the exhortation we've seen in earlier weeks to earnestly guard the unity of the Spirit. Uh, there are a lot of amplifications of that. There, when you think about it, there, it's hard to turn a page, especially in the epistles, without the Spirit of God leading one of the writers to say something that has to do with guarding and enhancing the unity of the Spirit in a local assembly of believers. There are many enemies because when you disturb the unity of the Spirit in a body of believers or in a family of Christians, you're disturbing the most sacred thing in the Christian life, and that's love. And by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. And so, obviously, there are going to be many enemies. Father, we ask for the Spirit of God to work upon our minds and hearts as we look to the Word of God to find your instruction, to find direction for our living, to find those paths that will glorify you and that will be pleasing to us. We thank you that the more we glorify you, the more it is pleasing to us, even though our flesh may scream. Open our minds and hearts, and we bless you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the Corinthians were certainly having a problem. You go through the book of Corinthians, and they had personal problems, they had relationship problems, they had problems in the church. And so the Spirit of God led the Apostle Paul to send along some solutions uh, the foundational solution, many, many years ago, I would say, well, the solution is 1 Corinthians 13. That's part of the, that is a part of the solution. But the foundational solution for this church and any church is the gospel. He said, I'm not going to say anything or preach anything among you except Christ and him crucified. Now, that's not our focus today, but that is foundational. And that is... Uh, it's always foundational. And then applying the Word of God to every issue. The Apostle Paul, uh, you know, if, if you're sitting in a Sunday school class or a home group or a preaching service and you're able to stay comfortable and not be uh, occasionally need to twist and turn because there's a little conviction, uh, you're either dead or you're in the wrong place. Because I don't see how we can read the Word of God. I don't see how we can study the Word of God without there being revelation from the Spirit of God. There's some change we need to make. There's some things we've left undone. There's some things that we haven't done or the things that we did that we shouldn't have done. And that's not a good thing. That's not a bad thing to be told that. That's a good thing to be uh, given revelation as to the steps we need to take. So, 
So that's in the whole epistle. Every plaguing problem they had. And then understanding and experiencing the ministry of the Holy Spirit and how that relates to a local assembly. That's a, there's a focus there in uh, 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. And so here is, uh, by the Spirit of God, Paul is going to set forth key works of the Holy Spirit in a local church. And so looking there in chapter 12, verse 4 through 7, part of that was read earlier, there are diversities of gifts, same spirit, uh, differences of administration, same Lord, diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit with all, or to profit everyone. So this is a chapter that has a lot to say about the gifts of the Spirit, and it's emphasized over and again that the Holy Spirit gifts are for the purpose of profiting each other, profiting all. It's not for self-advancement. The Holy Spirit gifts are expressions, the supernatural giftedness to serve with love. And so uh, those who want to discover their gifts, it's interesting there aren't any instructions here about how to discover your gift. We, we get this backwards. We're to serve. And in the context of serving, you'll discover your gift. Someone else may discover it before you. Uh, Mr. Mueller, who was a man of faith and was used of God to feed hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of orphans, uh, was called a great man of faith. He never called it. He never said he had the gift of faith. Others said it about him. And so, he said, well, uh, if I can't if I don't know my gift, how can I serve? Scan this. Regardless of your gift, this is the will of God for every Christian every day. And you know, when we embrace God's one another's as a way of worshiping the Lord, as a way of serving one another, you know what you won't have time for? You know what you will not receive any motivation for? you'll not receive any motivation in these scriptures to be selfish, to be unkind, to be unforgiving, to be resentful, to think bad or talk bad about anyone, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And as we embrace the will of God for every Christian, there, com there begins to be peace and joy and fulfillment in the will of God. And, and of course, uh, this all starts with, from the position of being in Christ. This is why we start with the gospel. And so from the position of being in Christ, uh, then what's the first thing that's going to happen when you're in Christ? You're automatically filled with the Holy Spirit. You don't go searching for some experience. When you're born again, your heart is flooded with the love of God by the Holy Spirit, which is given you, Romans 5.5. 5. And so we will be manifesting the ninefold fruit of the Spirit that are given in Galatians 5, love, joy, peace, etc. And as we go about living our Christian lives. This is normal Christian living. We, when we say normal Christian living, we're not looking for the norm of what's lived out by us. Normal Christian living is the Christian living that God has designed, that we are in Christ and that we are walking in the fullness of the Spirit. It's always a work in progress, but we, we don't lower God's standard to where we are. We keep before us God's standard of walking in the Spirit. And so, he said, but I don't, I don't know my gift. 
Don't worry about it. Pray these. Look at them. Meditate upon them. And then as you walk among the saints, as you walk among your family members, you know what? The Spirit of God will say, ah, now I have an opportunity to forgive my wife or my husband. Uh, now I have an opportunity to, to be kind. Uh, to, he keeps repeating about 16 times to love one another, to accept one another, to greet one another, to honor one another. And on it goes. And so, uh, in time, if it's needed, you'll discover specific giftedness. Now again, the spiritual gifts are special, God-given, Holy Spirit-empowered abilities to serve others. And again, when done, when manifested by spirit-filled saints, selfishness is root rooted out. There's no place for it. There's no time for it. Why would you want to manifest a life of selfishness when you can walk in the Spirit? Why would we, knowing our tendency to walk in the flesh and to walk in selfishness, knowing that that's our tendency, why would we not want to meditate upon these 40-something times? It's like God has a broken record. <laughs> he keeps repeating himself over and over in the epistles. Here's how I want you to live. Here one another's. Here's how you're to treat one another. This is not an option. This is normal Christian living. And so, so far as the gifts, as you look at verse 7 and 11, he is plain there in other places that everybody has at least a gift. So, again, don't get stressed out about what your gift is. Serve the Lord. Serve him with gladness. Serving in concert with these. The Spirit of God in due time will reveal some specifics about unique ways in which you can contribute to one another in the body of Christ. Uh, again, many people all over the nation are gathered in church services this morning. They have no idea about how to have an effective ministry. They have no vision of an effective ministry. Most of them sit there, well, I am not significant as a Christian because I don't have this gift. I can't sing. I don't preach. I don't teach. Uh, I'm, I'm just here. And people say, well, uh, I want to come to church. What can I do? Get, uh, assign me a job. Well, there, there are plenty of jobs that need filling in every church, but that's missing the point. Every Christian has already an assignment. And all we have to do is meditate upon these, pray upon them, and say, Lord, open my eyes. It may mean that during the week you call someone. You may write them a note. Uh, you may make a point to sit with them. You may make a point to go see them or, or do something for them. There's a thousand different ways in which the Spirit of God, or I may call you, just call them up, or go see them and say, you know, last week I was wrong. Will you please forgive me? This is true church work. You can either, you can either attend meetings, or you and I can function as a church, where every member is in a serving capacity. Ephesians 4.16 says that we are built up by every joint, that which every joint, every, which every member supplies. So, again, this is the way God destroys selfishness, destroys the seedbed of, unit, of uh, disunity. Spiritual gifts, God's Holy Spirit empowered abilities to serve one another. And so far as the gifts, again, verse 11, God decides who gets them, you know, well, let me give you this booklet, and you take this test, and it'll show you what your gift is. That's not God's way. Uh, may, you may have uh, had the experience of uh, meeting someone, and they look you in the face and say, God told me I have the gift of discernment. See, they're gifts that we like to have. It kind of elevates us. There's none of that. We all need a spirit of discernment. It comes from meditating and hiding the word of God in our heart. 
And there are people who are given a special giftedness. But you know what? They won't be telling you that and uh, you won't feel uncomfortable around them because you know they're, they're running everything you throw through a screen and they're going to let you know that they know what you don't know. That's not God's way. Um, notice in verse 15 through 18 that if the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not the body, is it therefore not the body? This is so elementary. Why would God say that? He must understand that when it comes to applying this spiritually, we're not even in kindergarten. It is so obvious. And God is not demeaning us. He's not looking down at us. The Word of God, most everything that you and I need from the Word of God to live Christ, to live the Christian life successfully, is in plain view. You don't need to go to seminary. You don't need to use fancy words. We just need to believe what the Word says. It says what it says. It means what it says. And God is not stuttering. And so he says, If the foot shall say, Because I'm not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, Because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where was the smelling? But notice in verse 18, But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it pleased him. This is God's business. Uh, people go to church and they have a list of things that they're looking for to please them. Uh, it, it can be a very daunting experience to try to move into a new, a new area and start looking for a Bible-believing church. And you'll have a list of things biblically that you're hoping to find. And, and so it's, it's a time to really be leaning upon the Lord. But I need to make sure that my list is on God's list. I'm not looking for a place to attend. I'm looking for a place to be a part of a body. If, if I'm moving to a new area, uh, I need to be joined together in an assembly, just like you physically, you're joined together. All of your body is the same. A part of your body is not sitting in one pew and part in the, in the other pew. You're sitting together. So, as I've said earlier, there's, there's, there's no instruction here about how to know your gift. So first and foremost, we serve God, we serve others, and God reveals our giftedness. Now, uh, verse 28 through 30, uh, no one gets all the gifts. Not only do it's not our business to decide, well, I want this one. We're not going through a smorgasbord and I like this one, don't like this one. It's God's decision. And nobody gets them all. So, having made some reference, we're, not, we're just trying to bring out the point of this passage, not to deal with every detail in it. But we might ask the question, as we think about all of this and unity, what is the basis for our spiritual unity as set forth in 1 Corinthians 12. It's not the gifts of the Spirit. Now, they have a part, but that's not the issue. The issue is in verse 12 and 13. This is the basis. This is the foundation of unity in your Christian home, in an assembly of believers. Christian unity with others in another fellowship where you might not agree on every jot and tittle, but they are solid on the foundation of the gospel and, and things truly significant. And so you can meet them for the first time, and after a few conversations you understand, I really have fellowship with this brother or this sister. And so we might do something together, labor together. But it's not the idea, well... Uh, there's so much disunity, there's so much uh, different denominations, we need to just uh, compromise on various doctrines and see if we can't come together to a happy medium. 
because our disunity is such a disgrace to God. No, that's not what we're talking about at all. That's not what the scripture is talking about. But here is the foundation of all unity, and it's the experience of every Christian. And it's no wonder that this is a point of uh, disunity or confusion or deception when it comes to masses of people. For the body, verse 12, for the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by the Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether it be Jew or Gentile, whether it be bond or free, and have been made, have all been made to drink into one body spirit. So we don't all have the same spiritual gifts, but in Christ we do all have the same entrance into Christianity in Holy Spirit baptism, whereby we are baptized into Christ. And when you say baptized into Christ, when in terms of this whole concept here about the body, he's the head, we're members one of another. Well, I'm a Christian, but I'm just going to worship the Lord out here under the trees. I don't need anybody, and I got hurt in a church, and I'm not, going to be a, I'm not going to be a part of a local assembly of believers. A lot of people, that's where they are. And similar with marriage. I got hurt, and so I'm not going to, I'm not going to marry. I'm not going to, there's not going to be any commitment. We're just going to live together. The two sacred things that God sets for marriage and a body of believers, people have decided to leave what God says and go their own way. This is, this is critical. This is foundational Christianity. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. We are all baptized into Christ. When God saves you, there is a supernatural union and communion now between you and Christ. But not just between you and Christ. Between you and Christ and all others who are in Christ. And particularly with a, an assembly of believers. I can't carry out I can't this morning or this next week carry out the one to another's with another assembly. I can carry it out with one assembly. I can't carry out uh, church discipline. I can't, I can't carry out a lot of things with the church at large. But I can carry it out in a local assembly. It's so significant, so many of the New Testament words are given to local churches. And so, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit unite us with Christ. The baptism of the Holy Spirit puts us into Christ. We are immersed into Christ. And then... Uh, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit puts Christ in us. Those are two strong emphasis in the epistles. That we are in Christ and Christ is in us. We are baptized into Christ and automatically thus baptized into his body. This is the essence of the new birth. And the indwelling Holy Spirit, Christ is now in us. Our body is his temple. Now, you say, I don't understand how this can be. Well, join the crowd. We, you know what we, when, when we say these simple and yet profound statements, that we are in Christ and Christ is in us all by the Holy Spirit, we should feel like that young girl of long ago who was told you're going to have a baby and the father's going to be God. Oh, I understand that perfectly well. Praise God. No, she didn't. 
But you know what she did do? She lived by faith, and so she said, Be it unto me according to your word. This is God's word. It's emphasized over and over in the epistles. We are in Christ. Christ is in us. This is the essence of what it means to be a Christian. It's not just merely believing some stuff. It's not just merely attending some meetings. It is a supernatural reality of being in Christ and Christ being in us. God says it. That settles it. For me to enter more into the experience of it, I need to have an application of some of the verses there in Romans where he spoke of believing in chapter 10. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So in the process of the miracle of salvation, there is, by the grace of God, belief in the heart and confession with the mouth. Then we enter more and more into the experience of that which is true reality. It is similar to what God said to Joshua. The promised land is yours. And you will experience that every place where the sole of your foot touches. That's why there's such an emphasis in the scripture about the Christian life being a walk. So how many of us ever make sure and have it someplace marked so that we'll remember to make this our daily confession? Wait a minute, I'm in Christ. Christ is in me. That's supernatural. That's God. This is not from Christ. This does not belong to him. I refuse it. Or Boy, I know this is what the Lord has for me. Because I believe his word. I don't have time for all this. Wait a minute. I'm in Christ. Christ is in me. He is supernaturally motivating me to walk in these paths. If I am not experiencing that, the Holy Spirit is grieved or absent. All Christians have the exact same standing before God. We are in Christ. We're indwelt by him. Christ is in us. There are no important versus unimportant church members in this body. We are all equally in Christ. Christ in us. This is our significance. Who we are in him. Well, I don't have position. I'm not in the pulpit. I'm not. Are you in Christ? Christ in you? That's who you are. That's your significance. Well, you don't know my past. God does. We all have a past. None of us would be benefited a lot if we had our past rolled up here. We've got a bad past. But God's greater than all that. I may be identified by the world as a convicted whatever. I may have things under the rug and in the closet that no one knows about and I wouldn't want you to know about. God knows. But if it's under the blood of Christ, I have a new identity. And when all that is tempted, uh, is flooded on me to tempt me to go back to the old ways, I'm in Christ. Christ is in me. I've been bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. That's not in the life of Christ, is not to be in my life. In Christ, Christ in us equals significance, equals power. So these ministries, the baptism and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, supernaturally unite us with Christ and with each other. And so, for the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body 
being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. There's, I don't have time to go into it this morning, but there are seven references to the phrase baptism with, by, or in the Holy Spirit. And none of them have anything to do with a second work of grace. None of them have to do with speaking in tongues or having some sort of ethereal or uh, jumping up and down experience. They have to do with being transformed out of the kingdom of darkness, in the kingdom of God's dear Son, of being brought into Christ, Christ in us. And so now, the fruit of the Spirit begins to flow. And there are gifts of the Spirit which God will use in our life. All of this truth radically changes the way we view ourselves and view other Christians. I, I can't talk about that person. I can't let all those thoughts about that person uh, rule in my mind. That, that's a brother. That's a sister. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus in heaven? Christians on earth? Saul beating up on Christians? The way I treat a Christian is the way I treat Jesus. This radically transforms everything. God affirms my, individu my individuality. I have uniqueness and individuality, but I am not to be individualistic. We are interdependent. So I don't go to church. Well, that's what you're doing this morning. No. Church is not something you go to. You can go to a ball game. In the New Testament concept, you cannot go to church. You are the church. This is not some cute saying. It's the fundamental core essence of what it means. And yes, we assemble. It's not shall I become a church member. Rather, because I am a church member, I'll begin to live and think consistently with the truth of who I am and whose I am. The question is, what local expression of the church is God leading me? To what local expression? To uniquely fellowship with. We gather to worship the Lord. We gather to be used of the Lord to build each other up. We gather uh, to go out and spread the gospel. Some of you here have been attending this local assembly for many years or for a few years and you still have no specific commitment to this assembly from time to time there are those who have given open expression to a to commitment to this assembly and yet live otherwise i don't think we understand how serious church is the called out ones we're here to, we gather to worship the Lord. We gather to uh, build each other up, to strategize and go out and encourage one another in the spread of the gospel. And a core foundation of how we're doing this on a daily basis is that we are devouring these concepts of true church work and we're asking, Lord, open my eyes because church is not something I attend Church is the way I act and live with others in the local assembly. And that's the greatest evangelistic testimony that we'll ever give. For by this shall all men know that you are my disciples as we love one another. This is so sacred. This is why we must guard the unity of the Spirit. This is why we must reject disunity. This is why we must function with the one another's. I cannot embrace these and be idle. I cannot leave a church service and go eat lunch and play Monday morning quarterback or have is what I used to say I grew up with a lot of roast preacher and roast deacon. 
while we were eating dinner. No more selfishness, no more pride, no more thinking I'm better than someone else. Humble servants of the Lord. We're to pursue the Lord throughout the week, individually, but also in our lives together, because we're part of his body. He's the head, we're members one of another. Can you say by the grace of God this morning that by the grace of God, you're in Christ and Christ is in you? And that means he's your head and you're not just a lone ranger in uh, fellowship with the Lord. You are in concert in fellowship with other believers. He places you in not just his collective worldwide body. There is one universal church of those who are born again by the Spirit of God, but he places us in local assemblies. It would make no more sense for you to have no commitment to this body and ascend only if nothing else comes out. It would make, what, what if I as a pastor you, you never would know from Sunday to Sunday where I'm going to be. Where are you, Pastor? Well, I'm in California today. Oh, I'm at the church across town. I'm sleeping in this morning. I'm fishing, boy. It's beautiful out here. There are times in a local assembly agree together. We're going to pray together. We're going to worship together. We're going to study God's word together. We're going to strategize in prayer and seek the Lord's will about supporting missions and missionaries and the work of Christ around the world. And yes, I have my own individual responsibility, but I'm, t I'm, in, I'm called to do this in concert with believers. Question. Is interdependent involvement with the other organs and members in your physical body an option is interdependent involvement with other organs and members in your physical body an option for health and growth and functioning as a body you say no nah. my whole body came this morning South side is a body. An interdependent involvement with each other, it's called fellowship, is not optional. Reading verse 14 through 27 from the New King James. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not of the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I am not the eye, am I not of the body? Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body as he pleased. And if we were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body... And the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. I don't need to assemble with the saints. They don't need me. I don't need them. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable... On these we bestow greater honor, and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, modesty, but our presentable parts in some of those senses may have no need, but God composed the body, having given greater honor to that which lacks that there should be no schism in the body, 
but that the members should have the same care one for another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. And if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members in particular. This is a glorious calling. The church of Jesus Christ, a local assembly of believers, is unlike anything else on the planet. On one level, Paul is talking about our physical bodies. His observations are obvious to us. Regardless of how a foot or an ear may feel about their importance, to the rest of the body, they are indeed important and they have a role to play. I don't think much about the role that my little toes play, but I ain't going to let you have them. What is self-evident in human anatomy, many Christians deny when it comes to the body of Christ. God is speaking not to somebody out there this morning. He's speaking to us to turn up the burners on getting in line with the Spirit of God. Rejoicing in the wonder and the glory of what it means to be baptized by the Spirit of Christ into Christ, into the body of Christ, to be in Christ, Christ to be in us, our body to be his holy temple. And for it to be a source of great humility and a, great, a source of great joy and a source of saying, Lord, here am I, send me. To brothers and sisters in the church, to a world in need of Christ. And it all starts at Calvary. Our Father, we ask for the ministry of the Spirit of God to take these feeble thoughts and that we would go to these scriptures and meditate on them deeply in the coming days and weeks and to rejoice in the wonder of that which is on earth that is totally unlike anything else on earth, the body of Christ. And when everything else goes up in smoke, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, will not only remain, but go into eternity to rule and reign with Christ for all eternity, to worship you, to serve you. Oh, Father, what a wonder. Yes, we have scabs and places that are hurting and we all have needs, but nothing outshines, no, nothing overshadows the fact that we are in Christ and Christ is in us. We have a supernatural relationship with Christ and with one another. And for this we pray and give thanks in Jesus' precious name. Amen.